Hello everyone and welcome to the May 2020 episode of the Pensy Fan Periodical. This is a new series in which I cover all of the major railroading events that happened within the month of May. And since we have a lot of topics to go over today, let's get rolling. First off on the list, we have Metro 79 finally repainted and in service in a new Metro livery. Originally delivered from Amtrak's Pacific Surfliner service about a year or two ago, this unit has finally been repainted into the average or typical Metro livery that's commonly used among MP36 locomotives as well as rebuilt F40s, with hopes that other F59s will eventually go in this paint scheme as well. Even though I don't understand why when they first arrived they were repainted into Pacific Surfliner colors instead of Metro right off the bat, but it's good to see them in service with the new livery just the same. Up next, Caltrain electric multiple units are now testing at the Salt Lake City Stadler facility where they will eventually go into service and replace their aging diesel fleet on the historical peninsula commute. After that we have the very light rail, as they call it, intended to restore services on smaller branch lines of Britain and it's also been related to other quote very light rail proposals. After that, we have Acela resuming service starting on June 1st, even though Amtrak still requires all passengers to wear face masks and will deny service to anyone who doesn't. But it's good to see that the Long Island Road is also following this order as one of their own locomotives have a face mask. Next, the Texas Central Railroad has finally been ruled a railroad in court, and interestingly enough, it has also been ruled an interurban electric railway. Up next we have CP Rail to acquire the Central Maine in Quebec. This was recently approved by the USTB and will most likely go into effect on June 18th or somewhere around that date. And I'm also hearing that the CMQ once acquired will be a similar operation to the Delaware and Hudson and Sioux Line but they'll still be under CP Rail trackage. Come to think of it, if you look at the map of the Central Maine in Quebec a good portion of it, especially going across the state of Maine, originally belonged to Canadian Pacific, so they're kind of retaking um, back old territory, I suppose. Speaking of acquisitions, the Vermont Railway System has recently acquired the New England Southern, and CRRC has acquired Voslo. In terms of new commuter rail projects, the MBTA has finally approved construction for the South Coast Rail project, intended to go into Fall River and New Bedford, Massachusetts, and meaning that construction is hopefully going to start within the next few months. Now me personally, I want the um, South Coast Rail Line to eventually go to Newport in order to connect up to Newport, Rhode Island, and even the Heritage Railroad that's down there, but hopefully that could be done in a later phase of the system since it is not currently proposed, but it would be following the original New Haven route to Newport. Even more so, the U.S. Department of Transportation gave a lot of money in funding to three major rail projects. The South Coast Rail Line from New Orleans to Mobile, another Hartford Line train, and a second Chicago to St. Paul train, otherwise known as the second frequency for the Empire Builder, bringing much needed service to each of these regions, especially for Chicago to St. Paul. In other news, the East Broad Top has chosen engines number 14 and 16 to be restored, Game of Thrones author George R. R. Martins has bought the Santa Fe and Southwestern Heritage Railroad to be restored, and Montana Rail Link is proposing on becoming a Class 1 in the near future. I'm okay either way with this decision since it's still a pretty good railroad that runs along the original Northern Pacific Rail Line and hopefully this could help them to bring up their credibility and their competition with our railroads and other forms of transportation as well. Now for some more interesting news. Smart Transit acquired a certain amount of miles from Northwestern Pacific Railroad and is planning on intending running both passenger and freight service on there. This is making Smart Train the first passenger and freight carrier within the US, something that hasn't been seen within the country since the Long Island Railroad up to the mid-90s. Hopefully with the purchase of this land, or rather mileage from the NWP, Hopefully Smart Train, Smart Train could eventually be able to 
hold more passenger service up along the original route and in order to restore the original passenger service that was established by the Southern Pacific back in the day. Up next, Biden and Trump Jeevos have been produced by MTH for Memorial Day, as well as, um, this. I don't want to alienate any of my viewers or get too political with this, but I am somewhat not okay with this since it's copying the original design of Bush 4141 for Trump, I guess. I mean, like, I don't, again, I don't want to alienate any of my viewers or say that I don't support him, but this engine isn't really my favorite locomotive that I am made, to say the least. In other news, Rail Exco, a railway preservation company, just acquired two Amphlee coaches and one Amphlee cafe to be added to a long list of private cars that are usually used for private charter trains. Even though I'm somewhat iffy on railway preservation companies purchasing Amphletes as coaches, I kind of feel it's about time that some of the Amphletes started being retired. I mean, like, most of them are going almost 50 years of service for Amtrak, and and most of them are planning to be replaced by the Siemens Venture coaches, which I actually prefer over the Amphletes, in my opinion, but... I would say it's about time that the Amphletes, as loyal as they are to Amtrak, would be retired and replaced by newer equipment in order to prevent any more complaints of Amtrak running old equipment across their system. Up next, British Rail Class OH Shunter has been converted with a new hybrid engine. This is hopefully the start of numerous Shunter engines being converted into environmentally friendly hybrid engines. Raritan Central 2093 has been repainted into, um, half Raritan Central, half Janice and Wyoming livery. It's pretty creative, but the Janice and Wyoming can still be seen with, uh, within the engine. The city of Austin, Texas is planning on holding a commuter rail or subway sometime in the future. The CSX Massanilla line, purchased by Canadian National, might fall through. Oof. ABB completes cable car refit in one night in Athens, Greece without disrupting any service. Pretty good. And Norfolk and Western Y6A 2156 is to be returned to the National Railway Museum in St. Louis. A lot of foamers are not happy about that. And in the scene that will be the closest we will ever see to Goat Simulator, nearly 200 goats have invaded the streets of San Jose. Probably due to the pandemic with no one watching after them. And a beaver has also been caught in Paradise, Pennsylvania, near the tracks. Thankfully, he is okay. Speaking of virtual rail fan, Feromex 4086 and CSX 365 appear to be damaged and will hopefully be able to be taken back and be repaired as soon as possible. And Amtrak 2112 has trolled viewers by saying just missed it as it was pulling out of the station. Speaking of online services, Long Island Railroad M3s are now available on Train Sim World. This is pretty great for a lot of Long Island Rail faners since it brings the nostalgia of the M M3s onto, onto the simulator in order to be enjoyed by all. This is pretty great that TSW was able to get this on, and I'm hoping that they are able to get our Long Island Rail equipment, such as the DE or DM30AC, or even MP15. The MP15 seems a little bit more realistic since they were able to do it before for Caltrains. Now for some sadder news. It's been known for a while now, but unfortunately, the Mount Rainier Scenic has shut down for the foreseeable future in Washington. There are some talks of trying to keep it alive and, hope, and for it to hopefully return sometime in the future, but they won't be coming back for a while. Also, the 36 axle Schneibel mm, um, rail car that has been in service since the 70s with 36 axles is rumored to be retired after one last run recently, transporting a generator. Facebook is planning on stopping funding for the Dumbarton Rail Project since all Facebook employees have to stay home in order to work from home until January of 2021. Canadian National has stored and retired the remaining Cal units, including the XBC Rail Cal units. 
and the world famous Mini Yellow Rail Fanning location among Long Island Rail Fanners is closed for construction to make way for the dirt track, which means the Nassau Tower will most likely be removed as well, which will forever change the landscape of Mini Yellow. A few days ago was the time to get a few last looks before the scenery would be changed with the dirt track. And even more so, it has been confirmed that Kim Jong-un cannot control space and time. This is a little bit upsetting as we all thought we could, but no one's perfect, I suppose. Now for some follow-up news for information that was presented in last month's episode. Metrolink has started construction for the Union Station run-through. Rock Island 4373 is the newest locomotive to be repainted into a Rock Island livery, essentially bringing back the Rock Island Railroad. And Canadian National Dash 2127 is the next locomotive to be repainted into this livery. High Speed 2 is also constructing the Old Oaks Common Station, which is quoted to be the largest station to ever be built in Great Britain. Even more so, U.S. Sugar number 148 was spotted pulling a sugar cane train in Florida to a sugar mill as part of a revenue freight service. Now that there are plans of this locomotive pulling more revenue freight trains in the future, this could possibly be the steam locomotive that will be crowned the title of the first steam locomotive to operate in revenue service in the U.S. in the 21st century, pretty much taking away the title that would have gone to SMS Rail Lines number 9 an engine that I did an episode on for Remarkable Engines. In other news, the Port Harbor Railroad has made a First Responders and Veterans Unit, KCS has made an Essential Workers Unit for workers north and south of the border, Railroad.net has had an online redo, I personally do not like it, I'm not happy with this new layout, the old one was better, they turned bread into a train. The Avelia Liberty has been spotted testing on the Keystone Corridor as well as the Pueblo Testing Center. Sonic Movie 2 is confirmed for a 2023 release. Durango and Silverton 1202 has been repainted into, um, an interesting paint scheme to say the least. Trying to combine the Rio Grande Scenic and the, um, and the Southern Pacific into one paint scheme. They could have done a better job, I guess. And Strasbourg is having an online vote to determine one of four new liveries to paint their new SW9 number 1235. I personally go for number one, but I didn't vote. Now we go on to Meme of the Month. This month's Meme of the Month is... The Exciting of Trains. Truly viral throughout the rail fanning community. It's a video, so I can't play it here, but... Because of that, I have selected an honorable mention for the title of Meme of the Month. And now, on to the number one top story of the May 2020 Pensy Fan Periodical. Brightline to start commuter service between Miami and Aventura, Florida, which is basically right below Hollywood. This is bringing competition against Tri-Rail to a whole new level, in which they are not only going to towns which are adjacent to Tri-Rail's existing route, but are also stopping at stations which are along Tri-Rail's proposed coastal link, which is going on present-day Florida East Coast and Brightline trackage from West Palm Beach and Tony Pena all the way down to Miami. I feel with this proposal that Brightline is focusing a little bit too much on rivaling Tri-Rail as a commuter rail rather than focusing on their inner city services such as Miami to Orlando or Miami to Jacksonville. However, with the introduction of this new commuter service between the region, competing with Florida East Coast Freight and now with Tri-Rail, at this point between that area, especially between West Palm Beach and Miami, they would need at least four tracks in order to prevent a large amount of traffic between commuter, express, and freight service. I mean, like, that's what I feel would be the most beneficial for all sides within that region because Having three different services on two or even three tracks wouldn't be enough to handle that much volume. So it's going to be interesting to see how this rivalry just heated up a lot more between the commuter railroad and the privately funded inner city express railroad. Thank you all for watching the May 2020 episode of the Pensy Fan Periodical. 
again, this is a railway news series in which I cover all of the railroading headlines within the certain months of the year. If you like this video, don't forget to subscribe and like this video. Have a good day.